Professor Jeffrey Sachs is the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, as well as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Professor Sachs, welcome back to the Climate Pod. Great to be back with you. Thank you. Well, I want to get into the current war that's unfolding between Russia and Ukraine. But first, let's take a step back. You've had a long history working in Russia as an advisor to Presidents Gorbachev and Yeltsin, going back to the 1980s and 90s. What did you learn from that experience that's still relevant now as we try to better understand the relationship between Russia, the United States, and the rest of Europe? Uh, Thanks a lot for a good uh, starting question, because uh, I learned how fraught The relationship uh, is, of course, I came in at the end of the Cold War. Uh, I thought, oh, this is a miracle. Here I am sitting in the Kremlin. You know, this was uh, not a Cold War normal period. But I saw that Cold War thinking remained very strong on the American side. I think it remains strong until today. I bemoan that. You know, I started uh, working with Gorbachev, who was so innovative. Uh, I mean, it was basically he reimagined the whole world in in ways that few people understood or, or agreed with on his side or on our side. But he thought, what are we doing? We share a a common geography in Eurasia. Uh, We uh, need to have peace. Uh, So Gorbachev said, we're going to have massive political reform. Of course, you know, when you're coming out of a repressive system, uh, all hell can break loose. And it did in in certain ways, in certain places, war uh, and uh, huge disputes. But I thought, oh, my God, this is a chance for real cooperation. My main point in the early 1990s was the United States should help make the transformation of the Soviet Union or of Russia to a a democratic and more open and more market-based economic system. But basically what I said fell on deaf ears, mostly in the United States, Uh, not not so much in Russia. Russia was kind of open to, well, if, if that's the right way to go, but in the United States, help them? Are you kidding? Uh, That was the view, and I regard that basically as the underlying deep source of our problems since then. Uh, We are, we just want to be in control. Uh, We, the United States, uh, it's a kind of mentality that is, goes way back. It's the American exceptionalism. Uh, It is the deep belief of many Americans and also at the top of the system that the world is only safe if America runs the show. And uh, I don't see things that way. My view is other people don't want to be run by outsiders. They want to run their own affairs, but in a cooperative way. Uh, And therein lies the, the tensions. Every day to now with this war, we still hear U.S. leader of the free world, U.S. leader of the West, U.S. leader of NATO. It's this leadership thing. And of course, many Americans say, Sachs, are you crazy? Of course, that's the way. I just don't uh, have that view. Well, in April, the Leadership Council of the U.N. Sustainable Development Solutions Network issued a statement asking the United Nations to do more to end the Russian war in Ukraine. Why did you feel like the U.N. wasn't doing enough to help bring an end to this war? Well, the UN means two things, first of all. It means it's member states. That's 193 countries. And then there is the UN system of organizations and agencies and so forth. The, 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 the real uh, political base of the UN is its members. And in two senses, there's the General Assembly, which includes all countries, one country, one vote. And then there's the Security Council. The Security Council is where war and peace issues are supposed to be addressed. There are five permanent members of the Security Council, each with a veto, the US, Russia, China, France, and the UK, and then 10 rotating countries for a total of 15. So when we say the UN should do more, the answer to my mind is yes, but that means several different things. It means the member states, 
It means the UN Security Council. Uh, it means the leadership of the UN. It means the UN agencies. The UN was established to end the scourge of war. Uh, obviously, it can't do that by itself, and it doesn't do that by itself, but it is the core purpose. It was uh, invented by our greatest president in the United States uh, in our history, Franklin Roosevelt, for the purpose of surmounting the uh, underlying reasons for World War II and World War I, the geopolitics, the arms races, the uh, the lack of uh, global rule of law. And so ending wars, making peace is the core business. I'm, I'm in another part of the UN uh, activities, which is economic development. And that's important. And uh, also the human rights side is important, but the core of the UN is about peace. And I think the UN till today is not doing enough in all of those contexts to end this war. Now, what we hear from uh, the rhetoric in our mainstream media in the United States is, well, Putin is, uh, is a Hitler uh, and he has to be stopped and we have to defeat him. And uh, it's as simple as that. And there's no talking to him. Uh, the man is uh, crazed. Uh, living in a dream world of, uh, of Russian imperialism. Uh, there's no stopping him. It, uh, any agreement is to rip up a piece of paper. I can tell you, uh, <laughs> since I'm an old guy now, 67, I've lived through this characterization. Every decade, there's a new Hitler that we can't deal with, whether it was Ho Chi Minh or whether it was Vietnam or whether it was Cambodia or Laos or Nicaragua, for heaven's sake, uh, or Iraq or Syria. We are real good at this game of rhetoric, but this is not real. And since I am all over the world, virtually all the time speaking with world leaders, what we hear in our media is propaganda. It is not real. We should be negotiating. Actually, Biden refused to negotiate with Putin in 2021 because Putin raised a very specific set of points. One was NATO enlargement. And then there's a chorus here that says, oh, that's a that's a phony issue. That's a red herring. That's that's fake. That's not fake. I've been in this issue since 1990, when the West promised Gorbachev no NATO enlargement. We're liars. I'm sorry to put it that way. We cheated. We continue to do this. And then Biden refused to negotiate. OK, that's straightforward, except it's not the way the story is told. Then there is the question of Ukraine itself, which is a ethnically divided country because there is a significant Russian minority. And those are real issues, by the way, although war is not an answer to them in any sense. But there was a, <laughs> a very complicated, uh, very difficult conflict where the U.S. was uh, stirring the pot also back in a decade ago and especially around 2014 and 2015. And there were actually agreements reached for the area where the fighting is raging right now for the Donbass region. And the agreements were called the Minsk I and Minsk II agreements. They were signed by the Ukraine government. And then the government said, no, we don't want to do those. And uh, when Putin says, well, what about the Minsk, Minsk agreements? He is shouted down or ignored. No, oh, they don't exist. They were unfair. They were this. They were that. They were actually agreements. When I say this, oh, I can only tell you how many uh, emails I'm going to get from uh, you know, Ukrainian Canadians, Ukrainian Americans, Sachs, are you crazy? What are you saying? But the truth is, diplomacy 
is crucial if you're going to avoid wars. Signing agreements matters. You can't just walk away from them. That's true of Russia, i the first to say. It's true of Ukraine also. It's true of the United States also. And so we actually should be sitting down and negotiating. And all of our media is don't discuss substance of what this war is really about or what its roots are or even what the claims of Putin are. Just say repeatedly, he's Hitler, he's a madman, he's out of control, there's nothing to do but defeat him. That's our mantra. That kind of mantra can get us all killed if we go down this road because it's false and it's extraordinarily dangerous because like it or not, we don't like it, but uh, Russia has 1,600 active nuclear warheads and we don't even want to sit down to talk and shame on our government not to have diplomacy with Russia. At least sit, talk, discuss and explain. We don't do that. We just say victory, victory, victory on the battlefield. Well, I'm, I'm not in it for that because uh, this is a very dangerous and very unwise approach. It's incredibly destructive and escalating this crisis is, as you mentioned, it only gets scarier, more damaging and more destructive from there. So what would an outcome, a reasonable outcome be from your perspective? What, if you're President Zelensky, what would you accept to get to a peaceful uh, resolution to what's going on now? This agreement was actually on the table back in uh, the end of March. And then Ukraine walked away from it, from what I understand, because the US told them walk away from it. Uh, we're providing the weapons and the US and even more the UK, you know, which which uh, is a more experienced empire than the US uh, and uh, has a, a mindset, even though it's, you know, it, it, the empire is long gone, but they still have an imperial mindset that is even more imperial than our mindset. Um, they said to the Ukrainians, don't negotiate, you don't have to, just beat them, beat them on the field. So what was on the table at the end of March was basically neutrality for Ukraine so that NATO and Russia wouldn't be right up against the border with each other, which is incredibly dangerous. Because if you have the two forces right up against each other, you are in a tripwire of nuclear war. We should have a, a zone where we're apart, where there's some time to talk, some time to work out problems for deconfliction. But no, we wanted to be right up against the border. But what Zelensky said back in the end of March was neutrality. Neutrality with guarantees. Okay, that's a very valid issue. How is that neutrality going to be protected? But that was point one. Point two was something on the Donbass. Even I said, okay, Minsk one, Minsk two were signed. You can't just walk away from those agreements. You have to do something about them. The third, which is a, everybody, by the way, on the inside acknowledges there's no answer is Crimea. Because Crimea is a really weird story of uh, Russia's seaport on the Black Sea, its naval base in Sverdlovsk. So fundamental for Russian security. But Khrushchev uh, in 1954, of course, uh, in a what was then a completely symbolic gesture when the Soviet Union had uh, administrative uh, lines that were within a, a, an overall uh, state, he said, OK, we gift Crimea from Russia to Ukraine. It didn't mean anything when there was a Soviet army and Soviet uh, uh, naval base and all the rest. But after 1991, it certainly meant something. And what happened in 2014 was uh, the pro-Russian president was overthrown. Uh, Russia views that as a US instigated coup. There is something to that, I, I know, uh, actually, 
but again, this is one of those things that the Western media simply will not discuss. And it's so deeply hidden in, uh, in, in classified documents that maybe in 50 years, someone will write a, a good book about Ukraine 2014 if we get to 50 years from now. Uh, and, uh, but in 2014, uh, the Russian president Yanukovych was overthrown. And at that moment, Putin seized Crimea. And uh, there was a referendum, hard to know much about it, but uh, Crimea became part of Russia. Okay, just to say three issues on the table, uh, neutrality, the Donbass and Crimea. Uh, and Crimea, the basic answer was, oh my God, uh, okay, we continue to negotiate, it's a frozen conflict. The Donbass, something like the Minsk agreements, and neutrality. And then the government of Ukraine walked away from this, even after reports that there was close to an agreement. Then uh, we have our defense secretary and our, uh, our, our State Department, which used to be diplomats, but now it's uh, warriors uh, saying, we're gonna defeat Russia. And so everything went away about the negotiations. Uh, so. The that's the long winded answer to your question that we weren't so far from actually having a negotiated outcome. And then Ukraine walked away, I think, under the instigation of the United States. You know, the reason Ty and I have been such long admirers of your of your work and your writing is this focus on internationalism and cooperation, global cooperation, which as a show about climate change, we obviously know that global Cooperation is essential to decarbonize on any kind of uh, sustainable timeline to limit warming at 1.5 or under 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels as outlined in the Paris Agreement. How do you think this war could have ripple effects beyond just the conflict we're seeing now? Do you think that this potentially could fundamentally reshape global politics in a way that could impact how we decarbonize around the globe? What we're experiencing right now is a great power confrontation. So it's not uh, merely a, uh, merely in quotation marks, a Russian war in Ukraine or Russian invasion of Ukraine. It, it is a US-Russia confrontation. But what's striking is that the US is engaged in two fronts, one with Russia, the other with China. And we're seeing a lot of belligerency by the United States towards China in recent years as well. Uh, this started around 2014, roughly actually the time of the, uh, those events in Ukraine, but really for somewhat different reasons, but are also escalating. And today <laughs> there's news reports that I find if, if it, if it weren't so deadly and dangerous, I'd find it satirical. Uh, it's stories in the mainstream media saying, uh, don't worry, the Ukraine war is not going to divert American attention from China. In other words, we're still going to have an antagonistic view to China. We're still going to make alliances in Asia. Don't worry. And uh, this is explaining that we can do both. Uh, we can confront Russia, we can confront China. And I'm saying, oh my God, is this for real? Uh, do we really want World War III? Is this, is this our death wish? Is, is this our uh, insanity? Is this our craziness of uh, our exceptionalism? But there is this feeling. Uh, we're in a two front feeling in the US and they're trying to talk NATO into opening an Asia mission. Uh, in fact, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, has said in the past year that NATO is going to direct its attention to China. Now, all of this is incredibly important for climate because China is essential for uh, global climate policy, for cooperation, uh, for every dimension of the climate crisis. China by itself can wreck the global climate because it emits about 28% of the greenhouse gases in the United States, about 14%. Uh, 
But uh, just remember, since they're four times larger uh, than we are in population, our per capita impact is, is much, much larger. But China it better get this under control or we have a disaster. So are we sitting down to talk with China about this? Are we working out common systems? Are we working out technology standards? Are we agreeing to co-finance projects uh, for decarbonization around the world? Uh, well, I think you could probably guess the answer is no to all of those. We are changing the rhetoric regarding Taiwan. Uh, we are drumming up uh, a, a drumbeat on Taiwan whenever in the rare moments when US so-called diplomats, but I don't find them very diplomatic, meet with Chinese counterparts, almost the first word out of their mouth is Taiwan. Because what they want to do is, an, I don't know why, but they want to annoy and provoke China and probably, and it's, it could not be more dangerous, encourage Taiwan into some kind of adventure that would be incredibly dangerous for Taiwan. I, I admire Taiwan enormously. And because of that, I would keep the temperature down so that there is no tension rather than raising the temperature, which I think can only hurt every dimension of this. Now, I, I was just uh, speaking with uh, the specialized funds around the world, uh, addressing some of the core sustainable development issues, the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility, uh, the uh, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and so forth. And what they're saying is the war in Ukraine is saying, is causing donors to say, you know what, we promised you we can't really deliver, so we're going to be late. Uh, you have to understand, we have a rising military budget, we have uh, a crisis, refugees. Well, this is what war does. War crowds out, <laughs> even, I mean, literally survival, but it crowds out any kind of longer-term thinking. And climate requires 30 years of investment in a concerted way, in a cooperative manner, in a trans-border manner. You don't decarbonize <laughs> on a whim. You have to make plans. You have to invest in uh, new uh, power systems, power generation, uh, transmission systems, grids that take 10, 15, 20 years to bring to fruition. So all of this makes the climate agenda uh, fraught, and also in the short term, of course, it's bizarre. You have uh, the Biden administration, which came into office uh, as a climate champion, trying to raise production of fossil fuels and say, go for it, because we have to offset uh, the uh, production uh, that we're trying to keep from being exported from Russia. So politically, you turn on the spigot again rather than saying, no, you should be phasing out and phasing in something else, we say, go for it. Go for the coal, oil, and gas, because that will defeat Russia. Uh, and this is, uh, <laughs> these politicians, these politicians are really going to be the end of us uh, in, unless we are able to get a politics that really works for our well-being not a politics that works for their incredibly short run horizons. Yeah, there have been many calls in Europe and elsewhere to speed up the transition to renewable energy as a result of this war. I know you've been skeptical in other interviews that this war will actually inspire that kind of necessary action. I mean, how has the decision to end Russian, Russian fossil fuel imports impacted the clean energy transition here and abroad? I would say again that the first thing is it just distracts because if you want to make a transition, you need clear long-term thinking. Clear long-term thinking, at least for me, requires some quiet. <laughs> you know, okay, we need to think through 10 years, 20 years, what are we going to do? But with war, it's day-to-day, -day, it's improvisation, uh, it's budgets that are shifted for armaments. And in a very practical way, it's reopening coal mines, uh, reopening fracking, reopening 
uh, gas fields because you scramble in the short term when energy prices soar, which they have soared in recent weeks. And with uh, sudden cutoffs of Russian gas, well, now Europe is taking whatever actions it can to keep the lights on, uh, to keep the air conditioning on this summer and so forth. And that means that we're not in a long-term planning mode. You could say, and there, there is a certain sense, well, uh, Russia shouldn't be exporting fossil fuels for the long term. So all of this is in the direction of long-term change. And indeed, I said to Russian friends and the Russian government for years, of course, you have to decarbonize. There cannot be a petro state in 2050. Uh, there can be a, a solar state, there could be wind power, uh, hydropower, uh, hydrogen economy, but there cannot be a petrostate. And in a way, yes, this points in that direction. But the problem is that the transformations that we need require organization, planning, and long-term finance, and war works against all of that. I want to switch topics quickly here because I'd love to get your thoughts on the inflation that America is facing today. How will passing parts of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, especially the parts related to investing in the clean energy transition, impact inflation? You know, the, the basic point with inflation is that we have a, 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 a holy mess that's come together to put us back into what's called stagflation higher prices, rising prices at a, at a rapid pace, combined with an economy which is strong at the moment, but is absolutely going to slow down, uh, maybe even have a hard landing. And worldwide, we'll have more inflation and even uh, a another downturn. Europe probably is already in a downturn because of the war hitting Europe even harder. Well, I, I came into economics uh, actually um, 42 years ago when I joined the faculty at uh, Harvard University, my first book was called The Economics of Worldwide Stagflation. It was studying this kind of phenomenon. The 1970s was a period of war, uh, the Yom Kippur War in, uh, in Israel uh, against its uh, Arab neighbors, for example, the Arab oil embargo, which is not so different from uh, what's happening now, a breakdown of monetary arrangements, which were then called the Bretton Woods system, because it was under the uh, IMF that the US dollar played a particular role in international monetary affairs. So there was this in incredible confluence of monetary, fiscal, geopolitical, and resource shocks that came together and produced a stagflation, which was worth writing a book about. So here we are again, uh, we are in a stagflationary mode. Interestingly, the Federal Reserve really had pumped up the money supply for many, many years. Uh, and especially after COVID hit, in fact, in two phases, one after the 2008 uh, great crunch, the financial crisis, and then again in 2020, even more remarkably in certain ways, the Fed pumped in money and nothing really happened on inflation except Bitcoin prices went up or stock market prices went up or some asset value prices went up. But, but prices in the street didn't seem to go up very much. And so there was the modern monetary theory, oh, we could just print money to our heart's content. And as a monetary economist, I was scratching my head, frankly, saying, how could the money supply go up so much and not have inflation? Well, there is some mystery to that that remains in disentangling all of this. But I would say the following. We've had a huge increase of the money supply by the Fed. We've had two huge supply shocks, COVID and the war. And the result now is that we are in an inflationary period that is painful and that is um, familiar in certain ways, more familiar perhaps than how macro looked two or three years ago. And what does all of this mean? It, it means, first of all, 
The world economy is unstable. That goes along with the war also. That goes along with the sanctions regime. That goes along with geopolitical tension. I don't like any of it because uh, it makes everything much harder and it really hits poor countries very, very hard. So we're going to have a lot of debt crises uh, coming up if, if we don't decisively take measures to head those off. Second, the inflation is likely to continue for a while because the underlying factors are not going to go away. Third, we need to sort out the basics. For me, the first basic is end this war. Second basic is end the, uh, the taunting and the provocations of China and some specific measures like the Trump tariffs that were put on Chinese goods that raised prices, by the way, but also created a trade war. Third, I've said now, I can't tell you how many decades, if we want to fund things to make our society decent, we have to raise taxes. You can't do it by printing money, and you can't do it just by debt. So this is a third point that becomes quite important. All really important good things, like decarbonizing the energy system, are affordable by definition. We can't afford not to do them. We will completely wreck the planet. In fact, decarbonizing the energy system requires a, perhaps a percentage point, even arguably a little bit more than that, per year of GDP in incremental outlays. Maybe, OK, it could be even more than that on some accounts. That's absolutely affordable. But we should have a tax system that is compatible with our spending needs. There's a lot of saving, by the way, that we should be doing in this country. I testified in Congress recently on the fact that our health care costs are roughly twice what they should be. We spend two times more than our peer countries on hospitalization days, on procedures, uh, on uh, on medicines and so forth, because we have a quite monopolized, privately owned healthcare system in this country, which has a lot of market power to jack up prices. All of this is to say the Build Back Better agenda is right, because those are about long-term structural changes. I argued, good, it's right, raise taxes to pay for them. That's the right way to do this. Whether we see another major piece of legislation in this country for years to come, I think is quite doubtful right now. I doubt that the Democrats will pass anything before November. The uh, looks like the Democrats will lose one or both houses of Congress. If the Supreme Court goes the way that uh, it seems to be going, we're going to have uh, just a, a mass of social conflict in this country also, we could be many years without a serious piece of legislation in this country, which is completely dreadful. And that's why being engaged in a war with all the things we need to do is just the cruelest, misguided misunderstanding about the role of politics imaginable. And I just, am so disappointed in Biden and so disappointed in his mindset that he didn't understand that we need to rebuild the United States, cooperate with other countries, and use diplomacy to head off war, not to just a stinger and javelin a weaponry to, to head off war. And I find it extremely disappointing that we are where we are and very dangerous. Incredibly well said. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, always a pleasure to have you on. And for our listeners, you know, they should check out all your books and work. But in particular, check out Professor Sachs' wonderful podcast, Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs, which is, which is in his second season. And if you like this show, you're absolutely going to love that show. Just have a much smarter host than what you hear on the Climate Pod. No but, way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but a lot of fun discussion with some great authors. Absolutely. Professor Sachs, thank you again for joining us on the Climate Pod. Absolutely great to be with you. Th thanks so much. Really a pleasure.